Nuclear fission. In this video, we'll define fission and talk about how it is used for power and how it is used for nuclear weapons. Fission is when nuclei split into smaller daughter nuclei. This will generally occur when atomic number is greater than 90, so generally only with very large nuclei. Generally when this happens, there will also be some neutrons ejected. So I have one example of a fission reaction shown here, where we have CF splitting into two daughter nuclei and also four neutrons. I'm drawing special attention to these four neutrons because this lets something else occur that's relatively important to note. So let's think about how this would relate first to nuclear weapons because that's actually the simpler thing to describe than power and what we must take into consideration when we're designing these weapons. Both nuclear weapons and nuclear power rely on the fact that fission tends to be a chain reaction. If you are given a certain mass, what we call the critical mass of material, and you bombard it with neutrons, you will cause a certain number of the nuclei to split. Once these nuclei split, you get more neutrons. And these neutrons will run into other nuclei, causing those to split. And those ones will split and cause more neutrons. Well, you get the point. When this happens, and when this isn't controlled at all, it happens very, very, very quickly, what you get is a huge release of energy. And this is what we call a bomb. We have to do something to start the chain reaction. We have to start that bombardment. Typically, the way that we do this is with some sort of what we call a conventional explosion. Maybe dynamite, gunpowder, something like that. In this little graphic, they have it as TNT. And that conventional explosion will cause a certain amount of neutrons to bombard the nuclei and will cause that to cause the atomic explosion. So, once again, we use our conventional explosion to slam our two masses together, hitting a critical mass, allowing nuclear bombardment to happen at the same time by that fast explosion together, and this starts the chain reaction. And this chain reaction is what causes the huge release of energy. And that is what causes the large explosion that we're used to seeing in videos and pictures and things of that sort. It's worth noting the, the giant mushroom cloud that you get is actually dust. And what happens is you create a vacuum. And then as the air rushes back in to fill the vacuum, it causes this mushroom cloud to happen. Now, this obviously has great historical importance because we all know that it was um, deployed in World War II. And so I thought it might be worth talking about the fact that these are very, very different um, types of bombs depending on what you're using it. The basic chemical principle is the same, and that's most important for you to know for this class, but it may be some interest from an engineering standpoint and a historical standpoint to know that when we talk about having stockpiles of large quantities of nuclear weapons, they are of a very larger variety of types. So I thought I would just focus on the two that are most infamous to all of us. So these were actually very, very different. In both cases, you can see, so let's start with the one from Hiroshima, what we call little boy. We have the two pieces of uranium that are not at critical mass. In other words, on their own, those two aren't going to explode. And then we slam them together with a conventional chemical explosive. The slamming together, one, allows a critical mass to happen so that the chain reaction can take hold and doesn't just fizzle out, and two, starts the bombardment by slamming them together. And we call this a gun-type assembly for the sort of obvious reasons that it's, it's in a tube, very gun-like. The second one I'm going to talk about is the one that we deployed in Nagasaki, which was called Fat Man. And this was actually using plutonium instead of uranium, so there's you can actually use different types of radioactive material in the bombs. And the way that this worked was to actually have this compressed plutonium core, which then caused the bombardment. There was all of these around the whole outside conventional explosives, and those conventional explosives then caused the nuclear bombardment, which allowed it to go off. Something that I think you should do in your own time is because it's very long, is to click on this, maybe watch it at double speed or kind of jump through. It's an interesting little video idea where someone took all the nuclear weapon explosions that we have ever had and they map it on a little time-lapse map that goes off 
and you can watch the first test go off. You can watch these two go off. And you can watch as new countries get the nuclear weapons and start testing them and how often they are going off and where they are going off. It's a very interesting thing to just kind of watch. Put it on in the background while you're doing something else, while you're doing some homework. And it's it's interesting. It's worth a quick um, meander over to. Now, enough about destruction. What can we do that's actually useful and non-destructive with this? And of course, there's nuclear power. Now, there's a big difference between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons is a simpler situation. You put enough mass in the situation, you bombard it with nuclei, and you let it go. We obviously can't do this all the time because we need to be able to harness that power. And so we need it to happen in a slow and controlled fashion where one, we aren't gonna cause huge amounts of destruction, and two, we can actually harness the energy that is coming off. To do this, what we need to do is keep the reaction from being exponential. We still want it to be a chain reaction. We don't want to have to set off conventional weapons constantly to get this ha to happen, but we don't want that exponential increase. So what we do is we set up a system where for after we set up the initial neutron bombardment, not all of the neutrons are allowed to move forward. So we absorb or somehow make sure that some of the neutrons cannot go further on to get more nuclei to f undergo fission. And the way that we do this is what we call control rods. So here you can see that we have these control rods so that they are not able to go on. And this keeps the reaction going because some of them are allowed to go on, but it keeps it from being exponential that's the main difference between bombs and power. It's just the ability to control it. But there is a lot of problems when this comes from an engineering standpoint. So one, you have to keep the neutrons at a relatively slow pace so that you're able to control the reaction. Keep it, everything from moving too fast. Be able to absorb some of these, etc. The way that we do this is by making sure that we have lots of water or D2O. D2O you may know as heavy water. That's another terminology for it. So if you've heard of heavy water reactors, all it is is water, except that the hydrogens have an extra neutron in them, and so it's heavy. We also need to make sure that the reaction is consistently cooled, and otherwise we would start melting the casings around things. You have to keep that controlled. So the way we do that is using control rods to keep the chain reaction in check. We don't let it get too hot because we only let so much of those neutrons continue on. We also use huge, huge cooling systems. And usually that consists of a lot of water and using steam to then turn the turbines, which also gives us some power too. You'll find that a lot of nuclear power plants are actually built by water. And that's so that we have a consistent supply of water that can be used. The other big problem here is that it creates a lot of radioactive waste. We can't really get around this until we get to the point where we can use fusion. So there's no real good solution for this. At the moment, we basically dig a hole in the mountain and bury it. Um, there's also been places where they basically dig a giant lake and put it there. There's been suggestions about dumping it into the ocean because thinking with the idea being that the ocean is so large that it will dilute it. I, I think we can all see the obvious problems with that. There's been other discussion about sending it to space which would be a great idea, except for the fact that we're not particularly good at getting things into space. Oftentimes our aircraft that we send up explode. And if we had an aircraft go up and it exploded and it was filled with radioactive waste, there would be some obvious problems. And so we're really kind of stuck with this one. And burying it somewhere is about our best solution at the moment. So in review, fission is the splitting of nuclei. We'll learn about the fusing of nuclei in the next video. This generally produces neutrons, which allow a chain reaction to take place. If you have enough mass, this chain reaction will continue to happen forever. And if that's allowed to go uncontrolled, we now have a nuclear weapon. If it's allowed to go on, but in a very controlled manner, where everything is tightly controlled, heat is tightly controlled, we can use that to create power.